Hey there, honey bunnies. Welcome to episode 115 of the Sovereign Storytellers podcast with your host, Michelle Wolf. Today's episode is Diamonds, Afghanistan, and Texas. Pain is relative. I actually wasn't planning on doing an episode today, but I'm actually excited to go pick up some pottery <laughs> that I did, that my daughter and I did, that's finally ready to be picked up, So I'm super excited about. But what happened is uh, I've been thinking about how you know, a common thing for people who start therapy and sometimes coaching is they say that they're suffering, right? They're in pain. They're, you don't normally go to therapy unless something is hurting you bad enough to talk to a stranger about some of the most intimate details of your life. Like, your pain has to be up there. The, People get forced into therapy. Usually they're under 18 or they're narcissists that people can't stand anymore. But, you know, or courts, I guess. I've had lots and lots of court-ordered clients. But <clears throat> generally, you're there for a reason. Excuse me for coughing in your ear. <clears throat> and again, <laughs> sorry. It's ragweed season in the South. So fun. But... Um, so I always have to have this conversation because they would say, well, this horrible thing happened, but you know, so-and-so had it worse or these things happened, but you know, I I know other children, other childhoods were worse than mine. And often they're wrong. Often they've, (laughs) the things they're describing are horrific, but they've minimized them and they've made them, um, normal. And, and interestingly enough, The people who minimize the abuse they experienced are generally middle-class white people. They don't understand that they were, some of them, horrifically abused. But it doesn't get talked about because it's middle-class white America. You just don't talk about stuff like that. Plus, there's a perception with people and some awareness that other people really are, in theory, suffering worse than they are. So it's like everyone coming at pain as if there's some invisible ranking system that if you're in pain, you're allowed to complain about it or to speak about it or to get healed from it only if you meet certain criteria and that you need to always qualify your pain with the statement around, you know, some sort of statement that somebody else had it probably had it worse than you. Well, that's true about everything. Somebody's always doing better than you. Someone's always ha- having an easier time than you. Somebody's always having a harder time than you. Someone's always in more pain than you. Like, and and we don't even know, right? Pain is subjective, completely subjective. Watch little kids. Like the same little kid can fall and bust their knee and one like bounces off the ground like a rubber ball and runs with blood running down their leg and the other one collapses and is devastated for the mom has to leave or the dad you know the parents have to get the kid and leave (laughs) we all are wired with nervous systems that perceive pain we all in different ways and we all have minds that come pre-wired and then we're taught pre-wired with some story uh story making patterns or plugins, whatever you want to call them. And then we learn our family's words that you put on things. Um, anyway, I don't want to go too much into that. I can get off on a tangent on that stuff because it's so interesting. Nervous system stuff <clears throat> and social learning theory. But you can go Google that. Social learning theory and anything about the vagus nerve. So, this happens to people with money. <clears throat> if you're a trust fund baby, you don't feel like you can play, you can um, talk about your suffering because, uh, it, especially if it has anything to do with finances, because peop- if people know you're a trust fund baby, you're immediately dismissed. I have some friends who've gone through that. I've had some wealthy clients who no one would listen to because people think if you have money, then money solves everything, which is a lie. Um, One of the most disappointing things to me 
in 2020 was that I was finally making the money that I had set a goal to make. And I still was really deeply depressed. It didn't change anything. It just meant I could buy cuter food (laughs) and more of it. And I bought some new clothes, you know, things like that. But it didn't, it didn't fix anything. It didn't change anything. My anxiety was still there. It just shifted over to a different subject. It just found another axe to grind. It didn't, the money didn't change anything. This also happens to, now I don't know about beautiful men, but I've had some beautiful, very like model level, beautiful women friends. No one will listen to them because they're beautiful. And again, we think the beautiful people have no problems. The wealthy have no problems. The beautiful people have no problems. If you weren't, you know, kept in a chicken shed and beaten with a rubber hose in your childhood, then your childhood pain somehow doesn't matter. It doesn't count. It doesn't meet some invisible threshold for going to get help because you have nightmares at night, you know? And so with pain is subjective, the mind doesn't see it clearly. Everybody's mind interprets it differently. And then we have our societal ranking system that we all need to be upset at the same time over the same subjects, whatever that is rolling through social media for the day. I am very vulnerable to that. But I can get riled up pretty quickly, especially if it involves a theme of injustice. Um, That's a life theme for me. And so... I can be really bad about, I have to watch myself because I can get riled up quick and not think about, I have to take the time to think about different ways to see things, different angles to look at it uh, before I, you know, get myself too spun up. So here's some examples of what I'm talking about. What I'm trying to say is, let me get, let me establish the bottom line before I go wandering off too far. The bottom line is, Terrible things are happening in the world that always have. We are aware of them now. We are aware of everything happening on almost every part of the globe all at the same time. And we've never experienced that as a species before that we know of. Maybe we did if we all came here in spaceships. I don't know. But in our living memory, history, the things that we have recorded, we've never had access to an earthquake in Haiti and a terrible thing happening in Afghanistan and terrible things happening in Texas and terrible things happening with people dropping like flies from COVID in Missouri and Florida and this crackpot governor and that crackpot governor and, you know, is anything bad happening in Canada? Oh, yeah, the residential school. So it's like nobody's free of it. There's riots and terrible things happening all the time and we hear about it all the time even if you're not spending a lot of time on social media you're going to hear it from your friends you maybe have some headlines here and there we're not generally aware of all the terrible things so when we know all the terrible things then we tend to discount our personal pain that actually does need to be dealt with because if we can deal with our personal pain, we have more longevity and more resources to pull from to take the the tiny steps that help the overall global pain, right? You can't fix your, you can't fix other people's problems in a sustainable way unless you've done some work on yourself. You don't have to be perfect to go out helping people. You don't have to have resolved your issues. Uh, I certainly haven't resolved my periodic depression. A cyclothymic, I think, is the technical diagnosis. But a couple of times a year, I really tank for several weeks, sometimes several months. I don't know if that will ever go away. But you you develop the skills, I've developed the skills to not let it destroy me and to try to mine it for some really good writing. <laughs> so I'm not saying you have to fix everything before you go help people, but you do have to take care of yourself. So the point is, pain is relative. This is what I always used to say to clients. Pain is relative. If it hurt you enough that you're in front of a stranger 
at 35 years old or 45 or whatever, and you're, you need to tell somebody about this story, that pain is legit. It's pain. You feel it and you are describing it as pain. Therefore, it is pain. Therefore, it is valid. Like we don't need a rubber stamp from somebody to say, this hurts. If you burn yourself at the stove, no one questions that. But we have those same kind of burns and cuts and wounds on the inside. And because people can't see them and it's not readily apparent, you feel like you have to justify it and then compare it to everybody else, right? So pain is relative. And let me say one more thing and then I'll go into the examples. Karen Curry Parker, my teacher, just put out, a, my human design instructor, just to, uh, put out a, I think it's on YouTube, but she was talking about how, you know, the old cliche, if you got to have a full cup, if you're going to help other people, you got to make sure you serve from a full cup. And she was like, and I totally agree with this, and I never thought of it this way. She said recently to serve from your saucer. So a teacup and a saucer, like the old kind, people used to drink from the saucer. You would spill the tea or coffee into the saucer so it would cool, and then you would drink from the saucer. I don't know if that was just a southern thing, but, you know, the saucer is there for spills, but it's also there to drink out of. But she was saying that if you serve from your overflow, if you fill your cup so full that it overflows and spills into the saucer, if you're always serving from your overflow, you're never tapping your own cup. Your cup is always full. It doesn't, it gets you out of this sick cyclical thing where you drain your cup and you have to refill and you drain yourself and you have to go away for two weeks and you overgive and then you get sick and you got to be in bed for a week so I like that idea like keep your cup so full keep your the love in your heart so uh con- so in your consciousness and actively working on it because love is a verb right we can't just flip a switch and turn it on we have to work at it um to keep that keep our hearts open and to let ourselves feel all the pain and the pleasure that comes with having an open heart but fill your cup so full that it's overflowing and serve other people with the overflow not your core resources i love that concept okay so anyway my Mom is downsizing dramatically. So, and I have a client who just sold a house and is downsizing in a very dramatic fashion. Like, some talking significant, get rid of almost everything kind of downsizing. And I have another client who did that and is now living a nomad life, nomadic van life. Uh, fortunately, she's not down by the river eating government cheese. <laughs> But she is leaving kind of this van life by the ocean. So a lot of people are doing that, right? Getting rid of everything and, and looking at, well, if you, I never can afford a house and rent has gone up to uh, $5 bazillion and a finger every month, how else am I going to live, you know? Um, so we were talking about how my mom has a friend who's going through something that all women dread and fear and having the kind, I don't even want to say it out loud, but, <laughs> but first of all, because it's private, but second of all, because it's scary things that men, women, that women worry about. So her friend is having surgery for that. And she's like, you know, and all I'm having to do is get rid of stuff. And I was like, I know it really puts things in, in perspective. And that's true. Like when we hear something, we're bitching and moaning about something and then we hear that someone we care about or something we care about, some subject that we care about is dramatically exploding. Then we are like, shit, I don't really have any, I really should shut up. You know, I don't have any room to complain. And in some cases that's, 
true. Like, we're kind of pouting around complaining about trivial shit when people are being stuffed in airplanes with a single backpack and three or four kids in tow, you know? And then you feel bad that you're complaining that um, you can't find a decent trash bag or something. You know, like dumb stuff. That's true. Like, there, we need those... Uh, We need to be sort of rattled by the scruff of the neck sometimes to be like, hey, express some gratitude. Have some gratitude for your life. Have some gratitude for these things that you enjoy on a daily basis and and rarely say thank you for. I've noticed that the internet, Seth Godin has written about this, the internet has made people rude. Um, You can say anything you want because no one can find you usually. But even rude to the point of people give away free stuff and half the people don't say thank you. Like, they just take. And we've been trained to do that by the internet because we're trained to market free freebies. Here, take this free thing, take this free thing. And after you get so many free things shoved at you, you stop saying thank you. And we need to rem- pick that back up, especially with healers and people offering free stuff. Um, you need to say thank you. There's an exchange there. I need to be better about that. We all need to be better about gratitude. However, <clears throat> when you catch yourself doing some like something like that, where you're just kind of being an ass or you're feel, uh, being a little entitled or whatever, you just can kind of laugh that off and be like, "Yeah, I need to go back to my gratitude practice. I need to remember that." Um, Yes, this is painful, and also, I'm kind of being a big baby about it. That's one of my favorite things to do, is be a big baby about everything, and make it take forever, and make it take a lot longer (laughs) to resolve, because I want to be a big baby about it for a while. So, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you have a real hurt, like, it really, something really hurts. Something happened, and it hurts. Um, I've seen people on social media get jumped on because they'll say, oh, this thing happened. And then they get 400 comments that are like, well, what about, it's what about ism, right? Well, what about Afghanistan? And what about Texas? And what about Haiti? And what about, I mean, Jesus, you know, can, can we just acknowledge that this person's car broke down and they don't have the money to fix it? That hurts. That sucks. That's a relevant problem in their life. It's a painful thing. It doesn't mean that they won't also shed a tear over the very sad situations going on all around the world and all around us. Like You can't go out in the world at all without seeing a headline or something that is something dreadful and terrible, which we all know that the media does amplify the terrible. I mean, that's how they make money. That's what newspapers are. (laughs) Is they're the deliverers of the terrible. Um, And we pay them to make sure that we know all the terrible things. So we might want to look at that. But, you know, so anyway, I said I wasn't going to go off on the tangent. And we're 18 and a half minutes in and I feel like I'm tangenting all over the place. I hope y'all are used to that by now. (laughs) So the examples are, I... When I was in my 30s and I had, I was working at social services and I had a, it was a good job as far as, you know, air quote, good job. It was killing me, but I didn't know it, but I was making more money than I'd ever made. And I had great insurance and I, it was, I had sick leave. Like it was so awesome. And I had built up, I think I was doing the Dave Ramsey thing, which he's such a meanie, like he's a meanie head the way he does things but I did have some savings and I had read something about cash negotiation when you go to a department store if you have cash on hand sometimes you can get a discount and I was like what that's bullshit how can that be the price is the price Uh, but no I found out like he opened my eyes so there's this whole other world that if you have cash sometimes the price is not what's posted and I had no idea I was raised so poor like I had no idea stuff like that happened um so I really wanted some diamonds and I don't buy diamonds anymore 
because I know where they come from and I'm very upset about things like that. Uh, although I have discovered a new company called Ether, A E T H E R, is that how you spell Ether? They take carbon out of the air and turn it into diamonds. Is that not the coolest thing? They're way out of my price range at the moment, but my goal is that they will be in my price range soon. <laughs> that's fascinating because I love diamonds they're beautiful they're prismatic I love the rainbows and diamonds so anyway in my 30s I went to I wanted to buy my own diamonds I had never done that and I had cash so I went into like I don't know something stupid at the mall like K Jewelers or probably not Zales but I think it was like K Jewelers or something anyway Souter, maybe. It's a Colorado company. And I found some teeny weeny little bitty diamond studs, stud earrings. And I looked at them through the glass, and they didn't have a whole lot of carbon in them. And they were, uh, you know, I could afford them. And I was so excited to buy my own diamonds. And so I got my guts up, and I asked for 20% off. And he gave it to me. And I was just stunned by that. I don't even remember how much they cost, but I was like, oh my God, I did a thing. I did a thing that that wealthy people do. I have cash and I asked for a discount and I got it. I was so, I was over the moon. Like that sounds ridiculous now when I say it, but I was just over the moon. I think it was one of my first experiences with power. Um like, I can buy my own diamonds. That's the mood I was in. Like, I was tired of waiting for some man to show up and buy me diamonds. Um, <laughs> and I was like, fuck this. I'm going to buy my own fucking diamonds. So, I, anyway, I have a lot of emotional attachment to those diamond earrings. They're so small. I think they're like a quarter carat total. But they're really pretty and clear and sparkly. And I love them. So, Juna, one of my cats... I tend to wear sterling silver hippie hoops in my ears all the time because you never have to take them out and they look good with everything and I'm generally kind of lazy about jewelry as I am about most details so but the cat for some reason after all these years noticed there was something hanging off my ear and he grabbed it with his stupid claws and I was afraid to move because if I Juna's half wild. He was very feral. And so if you move toward him at all, he freaks out. And so I was like, if I try to move his, get his paw untangled from my earring, he's going to snatch it right out of my head. And I'm going to have one of those earlobes that look like you were in a bar fight, but it came from the cat. Like, that's not a good story. So I just waited for a second, and finally the earring popped, and he popped it out. And I thought, well, fuck, they're out now. I might as well get the diamonds. <clears throat> and then I had the terrible experience of dumping my entire jewelry box out on the bed, and the di one of the diamonds is missing. So I'm super careful with those diamonds. I always put them in the jewelry box, but I don't put them in, like, the little baby box that they come in, which I wish I had of. Because when I moved... We had a terrible experience with the movers. So much stuff was spilled out. They just did a shit job of it. And when I was picking up all the pieces of my spilled jewelry box, I must have missed one of the diamonds. It fell out somewhere. It's gone. And I just had this pinch in my gut, and I was really upset about it. And uh, I couldn't believe it. You know how that thing, how you do that thing where... It's quite obvious that something is gone, but you don't want to believe it. So you just keep like digging and digging and digging. So I did that dumb thing for like 30 minutes. I And then I put all my jewelry back in the box and then I thought, okay, I have to just look one more time. So I dumped it all out again. And then I was thinking about all the things related to those diamonds. And then I felt bad. Like, ugh, it's a tiny diamond earring that you bought like 20, over 20 years ago. No. Yeah, maybe about over 20 years ago. And there's all these other things happening. And that last, I don't do guilt. So it didn't last very long before I caught it. And I was like, you know what? No, this fucking sucks. It sucks. It hurts. 
It has meaning to me. The tiny little object has a story wrapped around it that has meaning to me, an emotion around it. And I'm allowed to acknowledge that. This fucking sucks. I lost my fucking diamond. The fur blah, 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 blah. You know, I just went through the whole thing. I was told my daughter at lunch. I was like, oh, those are my first diamonds. I bought them for myself. I negotiated for them. This is such a big deal for me. You know, at the time, it was such a big deal. Uh, and I guess it still is because uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not devastated by it. But I'm just like, damn it, that fucking hurts. That hurts. I feel it in my stomach. I feel it in my throat. Ugh! You know? <laughs> So then it started me thinking because I had just had a conversation with my mom the day before about how you really can't complain about just your everyday bullshit stuff. And then it, when there's so much terrible things going on and I was like, yeah, we can. Yeah, we can. Because here's what's happening on a, on a global species level. We are being pushed to expand our hearts. We are being pushed to hold the both hand. And I've spoken about this a lot. We are being pinched and punched and squoze <laughs> and ripped apart. We are being demanded to expand our heart. It's the both and. This has been a theme for about five years Come to the table was the first download I got. Take your seat at the council table. That's on my website. It's an old blog post. You can find it. I think it's from 2015 or 2016. Where this same thing, like shit's about to go down and come sit at the council table. I had no idea what we were in for. I had no idea that astrologers would. I didn't know shit. But I had this overwhelming you got to take your seat at the table and get ready because shit's about to go down. So, we're faced with all these divisions. And the answer is not, we're all one. I hear that a lot. We need to remember we're all one. Yes, we are. When we're in the soul plane. When we're on the soul plane and I channel a a group of crystal entities, they're crystalline structures. I don't even know how to describe them. Um, They have a spokesperson who calls himself B, and he's very masculine, and he speaks for the group. So it's B and the gang. It's being. I've talked about them before. You can go back and look at some old podcasts, or you can book a reading. Uh, It's not on my website, though. It's michellewolf.as.me forward slash celestial you could probably find it on my instagram yeah i bet it's on my instagram in the bio anyway um they've given me the felt sensation while i'm physical of what it feels like to be on the soul plane as much as you can while you're still physical but i've had those experiences of oneness when i thought i was going to die but i was still physical so We can't, and they tell me this, like we can get very close to that sense of oneness at times, like you think you're going to die. I thought I was dying when I was giving birth to my daughter, and I thought I was dying when I was being robbed by some people who tended to kill people. I know that they thought about it. I felt it. I get hit in the head with a gun. Like I really thought, this is it. This is I'm not, I'm just now 18 and here I go. Here we go. It's done. <clears throat> and the oneness like swept over. So yeah, there's oneness. But when we're physical, there's fracturing. There's diversity. There's every one of us with our little pea brain interprets this world differently. I don't care how close you are or how much alike you are to someone else. You see the world in a way that I will never, ever, ever be able to 100% understand because I can't, because we're physical, I can't step inside of you and feel what you're feeling. I can feel waves of it. When your stomach pinches, my stomach pinches. But I don't see what you see I don't feel 
what you feel in the same way that you feel it. We will never, ever fully know ourselves as one while we are in a human physical body. Never. That's the point. The point is to be physical, to have a break from the oneness, to bounce off of each other and have these experiences that our soul group gathers and then other soul groups gather. And there's all these complicated things on the other side that are just our minds just can't get it because we're not supposed to. If you want to live in the oneness, you're going to have to wait till you're dead. When your body stops working, you pop back into the oneness. You don't get to do it while you're in a human body. It's designed to keep you from doing it. That's the point. It's like going on a roller coaster and being mad that you're a little nauseous when you get off of it. The point is to throw your body around and scream and yell, which is why I don't do it. (laughs) You people who love roller coasters, I don't get it. I don't like that feeling at all. (laughs) But that's the point, right? People who love roller coasters are like, again, let's do it again. They love that feeling being tossed around and your stomach flying up and down and screaming and hollering and that fear and adrenaline or whatever it is y'all enjoy. So the people who go on a roller coaster and complain that, you know, these things happen. But that's how the ride is designed. It's designed to toss you around like that. It's designed to scare the living shit out of you and make you scream and yell. That's the point. The point of being human is that you can't experience the oneness. We can talk about it. We can have flashes of it. We can have near-death experiences where we get to soak in it. Uh, And some people seem to do a pretty good job of maintaining it. But even they will say they have to remember it. Human, uh, The human experience is meant to separate you from the oneness. So telling people who are experiencing distress because they're losing their family to Fox News that we live in the oneness. <laughs> what the fuck? That is terrible. Don't say that. That is mean. It's discounting and invalidates their pain and their loss. We live in the oneness. Yeah, when we're dead. And in our dream state, maybe we visit the oneness. But we're not all one now. We're supposed to be learning how to figure this out. How to hold the both hand. We're being pushed into it. It's part of human evolution. Nobody evolves because they wake up one day and decide, I think I'm going to go experience some trauma and pain so that I can evolve and be a better version of myself. And I know that if I turn into an alcoholic and hit bottom or whatever, or, you know, have a car wreck or do lose all my money or do that stuff, then I know that I'll be pushed in and I'll evolve. No one signs, I mean, we, we do sign up for that, but no one like in a human body is like, yeah, sign me up for the financial disaster so that I can evolve. <laughs> That's the crap we, we plan out on the other side. You're allowed to hurt over lost earrings. You're allowed to hurt downsizing your stuff because you didn't really want to uh, for anybody who's doing that. You're allowed to name your pain and cry when you see those pictures of people crammed into 800 people on a plane that's designed to hold 150 What is that, seven or eight times the weight limit? The air traffic controller was like, congratulations for getting off the ground. And those people were sitting on the floor in a cargo plane. There's no seats in the cargo plane. There's no drink cart. You're sitting on the floor of a metal tube flying through the air. Some And some babies were born. And some fresh newborns 
Can you imagine? You got one little bag of stuff and a brand new baby. And probably some younger kids. People lifting babies over walls. Jeez. I don't even, I can't even imagine what that's like. I'm allowed to have a broken heart over that and still be in pain about my stupid earrings, right? And then Texas, my home state, I left there at 21 and never went back. And I miss Texas. I miss Austin. I miss San Antonio. Uh, I don't, I've been back to Fort Worth a few times and gone to the stockyards area and stuff like that. I don't, I wouldn't say I actually miss Fort Worth, but I do miss Austin and San Antonio. Those, I love those areas. They're beautiful and fun. She couldn't pay me to live there right now. God, where's the next Ann Richards? Like, she was the governor of all governors. And they've had nothing but crap since. Sorry for the sniffles. I try to remember to pause before I sniffle uh, when my allergies are acting up. Because I know that doesn't sound great. (laughs) So Texas slash Gilead. That's a Handmaid's Tale movie set come to life in a state are you kidding me I don't even know where to start with that I had two abortions when I was young both times I was using birth control both times I knew it was not at all the right time for a baby and I knew even at that age that the soul didn't connect to the body until much closer to birth I was treated nicely, kindly. Uh, The men I was with paid for them. I don't remember them being, I think they were a few hundred dollars. They were painful. It was a hard decision to make. It was a painful recovery. The first time I had to go back because the, I'm a fast clotter. (laughs) So they had to do it again because I developed massive uh, whatever. Anyway, I was able to get it, pay for it, be treated with respect. The second time I had just come off a 24-hour shift and the nurse let me sleep on the office in her couch because I looked pretty terrible. When I was sitting in the waiting area. I felt safe. Everything was clean. And there were doctors involved. And nurses to hold my hand. And my mom. The second time I went back. My mom had to take me. The second time for the first time I should say. And I was really young. I was. Uh. I want to say 18 for one, 19 for the other. They happened pretty close together, like about a year apart. And I knew. And I felt that the soul was available. The timing was wrong. And even the first one, I was 18, but I'd already been meditating for two years by then. So I felt that it was a boy and that that soul was there and also that it was okay that the timing was wrong. You have your beliefs about abortion, whatever you want to believe. But for me, both times I had a conversation with the soul and was like, hey, wrong time. Please move on to the next (laughs) pregnant person in line. That's the wrong time for me. I don't choose this right now. So I had that because of what women had gone through before me, what the women who came before me fought for, scrapped for, bled for, cried for. They did all that agonizing work so that I could 
make that decision and be safe and well cared for while I made a hard decision and while my body went through some shit. And now that's gone in Texas. And not only is it gone, but they've placed a bounty on people's heads where anyone can file a lawsuit and potentially win $10,000. But if they lose, they don't have to pay your legal fees. But if they win, in theory, they get a $10,000 check. To even say that out loud, sounds like I'm talking about a, a pitch, like a movie pitch for some dystopian nightmare. I feel like I'm pitching a, a story to a studio exec. Yeah, we'll do, we'll have this thing. Well, that sounds like The Handmaid's Tale. Well, kind of it is, but this time we're going to pay people to turn people in and whatever, hold them Ugh. Ugh. So revolting and terrifying and scary and sad. I'll guess terrifying and scary the same thing. <laughs> it's just, it, you know, where do we even go with that? Our hearts are being demanded. We have to hold the both and. The extreme scary. Every damn thing's on fire. And every damn thing else is underwater. And all people are just going nuts. People with power are going nuts, which is worse because they can create lasting harm. And I lost my damn diamond earring. And my mom's downsizing all her pretties. She has pretty stuff. <laughs> just great. She has nice our furniture. <clears throat> She's moving down here. It's got to go. It uh, the cost of having to move things is not worth the cost of rebuying them here. But moving trucks are crazy expensive. Moving companies are even more expensive, you know. So if you don't have a company paying for your move, you have to sometimes make some hard choices. So when you think about your pain, don't trivialize it. It still hurts. Beautiful people still hurt. Wealthy people still hurt. People who grew up in middle-class white neighborhoods sometimes have far worse, if we're going to rank worse, abuse than people who grew up in the projects because their abuse was hidden and it was subtle and hard to detect and they, their abusers were master gaslighters and so people end up, in those kinds of abuse situations, they end up feeling insane because the reality that they know is the truth gets so twisted that they aren't sure what's real anymore. And then they can't trust themselves anymore. So we spend a lot of time, well, not anymore, but I used to spend a lot of time helping people validate their memories. Like, yeah, that, that actually is really fucked up. <laughs> That's abusive. That is horrible. That's mental torture. The things you went through are extremely valid. But I shouldn't have to say that, right? Pain is pain. The pain of losing a tiny little earring that I only wear once a year or so <clears throat> is still pain. It's still something I need to pay attention to and to take care of. The pain of downsizing when you don't really want to down... It's different when you want to downsize. But I, I saw something the other day where a lot of people who are doing this van life thing... If you haven't seen the movie Nomad Land, go watch it. Or if you haven't read the book, go read it, Nomad Land. A lot of people are doing that because they don't have any other options. That's not... That's painful. If you're living in a van because you cannot see a way that you're ever going to make it enough to own a home, there's some sadness in that. Like, that sucks. We should have the choice to be a homeowner or live a, live a van life. That shit ain't easy. Tiny home living is not easy. I didn't live in a tiny home 
for six years in LJ, it was 600 and something square feet. It felt like a tiny, <laughs> tiniest home I think I've ever lived in. It was not much bigger than the first studio apartment I had, which was 400 square feet. I didn't like it. You ran out of places to put your shit. <laughs> I don't have a lot of shit. But here's what I don't want to have happen is people pushing their pain away because other pain seems more valid and bigger. I think we can agree that being on sitting on the floor of a cargo plane with a newborn baby and a backpack that owns holds every single thing you own and you're leaving your home and you don't know if you're ever going to get to go back there, I think we can agree the intensity level of that is probably bigger than my intensity level over losing an earring. So, and, the both and. When we push little pain away, it becomes bigger pain later. Because pain is pain. You've got if you cut your finger with a knife, you've got to tend to it. You, the integrity of your skin is broken, and now bacteria and shit can get in there, and you could get a staph infection and literally die from a single cut on your from just from chopping broccoli in the kitchen. Right? Simple stuff kills people. If you chop your leg off with a chainsaw, please don't do that. That's got to be tended to or you're going to be dead quick. So it, maybe we could talk about intensity levels. Me bandaging a cut on my finger is a little bit less intense than having to deal with a chopped off leg. But both have to be tended to because of the long-term consequences of ignoring them can be deadly. The long-term consequences of ignoring little daily aches and pains puts pressure on your nervous system, puts strain on your heart, leaves you open to developing the stress-related diseases. So they're not insignificant. They have to be tended to. So this thing of comparisonitis in the worst way of whose pain, who's the bigger victim here, who gets more air time to talk about their hurts, the things that are hurting their heart. That's got to go. From the big picture, that's what they're saying. That yes, these terrible things are happening and our climate is teetering on the brink. I mean, we're already in the sixth mass ex- extinction that this planet has gone through, already in it. We don't see it because we have little pea brains that can't comprehend all the things. And we're not climate scientists. And then we got COVID on all of that. So it's a stretching. How much can you allow? Doesn't mean you have to go hang out with anti-vaxxers or try to convince them otherwise. Please don't even waste your breath. You're not going to make an inroad there. I used to be scared of vaccines. I'm not scared of the new ones. The new ones are safe as safe. The new ones are miraculous. But when my daughter was small, I was totally anti-vaccine. Fuck that. I was absolutely convinced that they were uh, the devil in a syringe. (laughs) You couldn't have convinced me. You would have to fought me tooth and nail when I was, I was 21 when my daughter was born. And you would have had to fight me tooth and nail to poke a vaccine in her. She got her vaccines later when I understood what doing the research actually meant. What it actually means and how to read research reports and how to ask actual questions and not get my shit off YouTube. But don't waste don't waste your time on that. You can you don't I'm saying you have to hold the both hand and allow all the things to have space in your heart. That doesn't mean you go to lunch with 
people who may potentially make you sick because they won't take the vaccine and they won't wear a mask. Part of me can understand the vaccine fear because I had it. I've been there. I felt that. I thought it was all a government, big pharma, whatever. But if someone said to me, you can still make me sick, but if you wear a mask, you really reduce the chances of making me sick and having to suffer the consequences of your decision, I would have had that mask on my face because I don't want to make people sick. I don't want to be the vehicle where COVID reaches somebody else because I'm deciding not to get a vaccine. I'm going to take that personal risk. But then I'm going to wear a mask so that you don't also ride the train of my terrible decisions. That part I don't understand. If you're not going to take the vaccine, wear a goddamn mask. This is not difficult. So, anyway. What is it with me in the tangents today? Oh, God, I've been talking for 50 minutes. <sighs> Here's what I want to say. Let me see if I can bottom line it. Don't trivialize your pain. Your pain is valid because it is pain. It doesn't matter where it came from. It doesn't matter if it's over a little diamond earring or a giant thing like Texas is bullshit or flipping COVID. Pain is still pain. It has to be tended to. And the other piece is look at how you can hold your air quote trivial pain with the pain of all the other stuff and stretch your heart. Stretch the room inside your heart to hold the both and, to hold the absolutely tragic and terrible with the hopeful, with the optimistic, with the love. Love, true love, has all of it in the bucket. <clears throat> All of it. Burglars and butterflies. It has everything in it. That is the soul level love that we can practice here while we're physical. We can practice that. We can stretch into that. And our to survive intact without totally losing our shit and running down the streets naked singing show tunes, like we're going to have to expand our hearts to hold more of the both hand you hold it you feel it you love it all and then you have good boundaries on a practical level and you don't put yourself in harm's way because you think we're all one and therefore we should be able to be around people who are abusive who don't care enough about you to put a piece of paper over their face or whatever it is for you so, I hope that you're understanding that there's a continuum here of where we look at things, and we need to be able to hold more in our heart, in our ability to love. Good Lord, can you can we agree that this is highly challenging our ability to love? That's the bigger picture. Pain is pain is pain is pain. It's pain. Doesn't matter. Don't lose sight of the wonderful things happening while you're saying prayers and holding space for terrible things. All of it. Allow all of it. The mantra in Access Consciousness, which, which is an organization I don't support, let me be clear on that, but... There, I love the mantra of all of life comes to me with ease and joy and glory. I might be saying that wrong. I feel like I might have some words or maybe I left some words out. But I like that. I have it uh, on several places in my journals. All of life comes to me with ease and joy and glory. When we say that on the surface, we think, oh yeah, I want all of life. I want all the things. But all the things includes Texas and COVID in Afghanistan, and Haiti, and whatever terrible thing happened last night that I don't, I, I don't know about yet because I haven't been on the internet. 
You know, all of life means all of life. And that's the soul message that I keep getting. It's both and. Stretch your heart. Hold it all. All of life comes to me with ease and joy and glory. Interesting. So reword that for yourself. Think about it. See where you can stretch your heart. Notice if you're shoving your own pain and discomfort away because other people seem to be hurting worse than you. See if you can stop categorizing it that way of this amount of suffering and that versus that amount of suffering and the validity of it all. Don't invalidate your pain. All right, I think I better shut up. I got to get on the road to go get that pottery. Um, So hopefully this makes sense and... Let's see, just for pure business stuff, again, you can get a reading, which is from Be In The Gang, michellewolf.as.me forward slash celestial, or go to my Instagram page, which is instagram.com forward slash michellewolf11, and check the link in the bio. I'm pretty sure it's in that, where you can just click it. Next course starting is Unfuckwithable Warriors, September 15th. That's cool. That's on the website, thatmichellewolf.com. And then the big six-month course, which will never be offered again in any form whatsoever. This is the last round of it. It was Big Issue, Big Magic, and then it was Sovereign Storytellers for years, and then it was Wounded to Wise, And it kept evolving, and now it's been holistic magic, and this is the last year that you can get it. It's six months long. It's the higher level investment, so go take a look at that. It starts at the end of the month, but you only have till September 15th to enroll because I have to send you a package of stuff. So there has to be time for that. All right. Um, In the meantime, before we talk again, think less, feel more. Take good care of yourselves. Make sure that you validate your whole experience. Okay. See ya.